I know why you're here. You have questions, doubts, fears. What is Wulong and which dynasty does it fall under? As Neo and Sekiro is for Japan, Wulong is for China. In this video, we're gonna cover everything you need to know about the factual history of Wulong. So when you play the game, you can have the most immersive experience. But don't forget to immerse yourself in my channel by subscribing. Developer Team Ninja was doing Dark Souls before it had a name with Ninja Gaiden. Publisher Koi Tecmo has made an industry out of Three Kingdoms with their Dynasty Warriors and Romance of the Three Kingdoms strategy games. But this was different. It's an action RPG, a dark fantasy vision of the Three Kingdoms mixing warlords with mythological beasts. Masaaki Yamagiwa of Bloodborne was along for the ride as producer, an absolute dream team. But how do you fathom thousands of years of lore? Warlords you can't even tell apart, and names of the divine beasts you can't even pronounce. Don't worry, this video has you covered. Now, explaining the historical background of Wulong, where's Jesse? All those Three Kingdoms games, comics, movies, TV series, yeah, they're all more or less based on the 14th century novel, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, attributed to Lord Guanzhong, one of the so-called four classics of Chinese literature. Five if you count the very, not safe for work, Golden Plum Vase. The novel is a semi-mythological retelling, think the Iliad and the Odyssey, of events that happened way, way back in the 2nd, 3rd century CE. So the novel was written more than a thousand years after the fact. To be fair, it was drawing on Chen Shou's 65 volume 3rd century historical account, The Records of Three Kingdoms. So all cool I guess. The novel describes the fall of the Han Dynasty. Ding ding ding, that's the dynasty of Warlong Fallen Dynasty. And the emergence of three rival kingdoms, the Wei, Shu, and Wu. And finally, a kind of reunification under the Jin Dynasty in 265 CE. Simple right? Right? The opening line gives the feel for the grand sweep of Chinese history. The empire, long divided, must unite. Long united, must divide. Thus, it has ever been. Quick sidebar, Wolong means hidden dragon, as in crouching tiger hidden dragon. Yeah, the Ang Lee film. It's somebody potentially living unknown or in seclusion, like an emperor in hiding, for example, or just maybe our protagonist. Anyway, for perspective, the earliest dynasties, the Sha and Shang, go back past 2000 BCE. But true unification wasn't achieved until the Qin, 221 to 206 BCE, whereupon Liu Bang established the Han Dynasty. Wulong Fallen Dynasty picks up in 184 CE, some 400 years later, in the twilight years of the Han. Centering on the turmoil of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, named for their yellow attire. Alert, this is where the game takes some liberties and inserts some good old fashioned magic, Qi magic. Since it's China after all, Qin Shi Huang, of the Qin Dynasty, obviously, first emperor of China was obsessed with finding the elixir of life. In Fallen Dynasty, it is demonic qi, as opposed to mercury poisoning that did him in. This is in contrast to the genuine qi, which we'll have to use to level up in the game. Demonic qi, the elusive elixir and the Taoist alchemists, which claim to be able to produce it, a key to the plot. With the mysterious Taoist in black seemingly behind both the yellow turbans and the demonic infestation which your nameless protagonist sets out to defeat. Our first clue is the Taoist in black's interest in the chi field of the blind boy you encounter at the beginning of the game. The boy is connected with Xu Fu, court sorcerer to Qing Shi Huang through the dragon's cure pot, similar to the actual historical immortality medicine bottles unearthed in Luoyang, Henan province. In the game at least, if not history, Elixir, gifted by the Taoist in black, confers rebellion leader Zhang Jiao and his brothers Zhang Bao and Zhang Liang with superhuman abilities. As producer Yamigawa explained to Aijian, warlords may transform into a demon by taking a dangerous serum. Once they become a demon, their power and feelings will be manifested in a distorted way. More on the whole Yellow Turban rebellion deal. Terrible floods, famine, taxes, and the growing corruption of the eunuchs all fed into the grievances of the common people. This precipitated your textbook peasant uprising. The Han had lost the mandate of heaven and the divine right by which they ruled. 
Imperial courts are no strangers to power struggles, a la Game of Thrones. But with the disasters of the partisan prohibition starting in 166, the eunuchs were able to suppress their opponents and gain unprecedented power and wealth. Ten of the most powerful eunuchs formed the Ten Attendants, with great sway over the emperor. Stepping in to exploit the latent anger of the people was Zhang Zhao, a self-professed Tower sorcerer who claimed that the blue sky would soon turn yellow, hence the Yellow Rebellion, marking the final downfall of the Han. The firmament has perished. The yellow sky will soon rise in this year of Jiaozi. Let there be prosperity in the world. Zhang Jiao and his brothers claim to be descendants of Zhang Daling, founder of the Tao sect Way of the Celestial Masters, which emphasized Qi's role in the nature of all things, with the further moral dimension that illnesses originated in the loss of Qi through sin, so confession and minimizing Qi loss became important tenets. The rebellion is where the novel, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms begins, and while it was ultimately overcome, the Han would be fatally weakened. Other characters that show up in Wolong also go on to play pivotal roles. The warlord Dong Zhuo would seize power after leading his troops into the ancient capital Luoyang, ostensibly to take down the Ten Attendants. And later Cao Cao, who would wrest control after Dong Zhuo's murder in 192 CE. This all culminated in the Battle of the Red Cliffs, which incidentally was made into a terrific and terrifically long film by John Wu. Now, take a breath, because the hard work is over. Now we're going to hand it over to Edison to talk about Divine Beasts. The demons and beasts of Wulong are all adapted from Chinese legends. Key source texts include the 4th century BCE classic of mountains and seas. A mythological, geographical account full of fantastical creatures. Within Wulong, players can call upon Divine Beasts to aid in battle based on the four auspicious beasts which organize the constellations in Chinese astronomy. Each beast is connected to a section of the sky and is thus associated with a cardinal direction, dividing up the 28 sections which are the traditional constellations. Each is also assigned a color and season and in the context of the game can help repel demonic qi. Though there are generally four beasts, it is not uncommon to see a fifth adopting the Tao system of five phases central to mechanics and philosophical principle supporting the game. A beast per each of the five elements. These elements follow a fixed cycle of generation and transformation, mirrored in historical cycles as espoused by the yellow turbans. The fifth beast in this case is Qi Ling, which maybe you've heard of. Here's a rundown and sequence of how the elements are set to evolve. Dubbed the Chinese Unicorn, they are said to appear with the birth or death of a great sage or ruler. Records tell of sightings connected to Confucius in the mythological Yellow and Yao emperors at the dawn of Chinese history. Depictions have varied over time. Some indicate a dragon's head instead of a horn. The body may be like a tiger or deer. Sometimes it has scales, other times flames. The tail is like an ox. Legends of the Qiling spread to encompass Korea and Japan as well. Zheng He, China's greatest explorer, brought back a giraffe that was taken to be a Qiling. Even today, the Japanese and Korean words for giraffe were derived from this. Baihu is a white fur tiger with black stripes, a curving tail, blue eyes, and formidable claws. It is associated with autumn and said to have command over the weather. Baihu is a symbol of strength and courage. The idea of mythological white tiger may be traced from older legends which stated a tiger's tail will turn white if it reached the age of 500. A giant tortoise with a black scale shell entwined together with a snake. It is associated with winter as well as longevity, wisdom, and protection. Turtles are seen as lucky charms and have an important role in feng shui, including the dragon turtle or bc, but also xuan wu. The creature is particularly present in Taoism, taking human form as Zheng Wu or the perfected warrior, with temples worshipping it to this day. Xuan Wu corresponds to the Genbu of Japanese mythology. Qinglong is a long serpentine creature with four legs, sharp claws, and a pair of antlers or horns. 
It is usually portrayed as blue or green in color, and its scales are said to be as hard as iron. It is also associated with spring and the auspicious number nine. Connecting back to events of Wulun, part of the reign of Cao Rei, also known as Emperor Ming of Wei, the grandson of the most famous Three Kingdoms era, General Cao Cao, was dubbed Qing Lun. That shows the high regard for this creature during that time. This striking red bird is of the fire element and therefore represents summer. It can often appear as a hybrid creature with features of both phoenix-like bird and a dragon. It is occasionally associated with the more well-known feng huang, a yin and yang combination of the words feng, the male, and huang, the female. Besides everything I mentioned, you also face other creatures as bosses or other ways. Many are on the obscure side, with few references in English. But lucky for you, I've done the research. So let's run through a few notable examples. The classic tale of mountains and seas speaks of a beast in the mountain that devours people. It resembles a cow with a white body and four horns, furry like an oversized coat. In the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, Liu Ji, a sort of Chinese Nostradamus, spoke of the Aoye as having five colors of eight shades, bright patterning, shining tiger eyes, body of a red yak, a black mane, and tassels. The Aoye is no stranger to video games, having first appeared in 2003's The Legend of Sword and Fairy 3, among other titles. Water spirits are common to many cultures. There's the Scottish Kelpie or the Kappa of Japan. Chinese folklore speaks of malicious spirits of suicides or drownings in rivers and lakes, souls unable to reincarnate. They lurk beneath the surface, pulling people down so they can hijack their body and continue the cycle. They're also known as water monkeys. A giant wild boar who lived in the water and was extremely greedy. This creature was heavy with yin energy, which can cause rain. This was enough to create floods big enough to displace a village of people. So while the Feng Xi was not known to kill or eat people, the legendary Emperor Yao ordered it to be killed to end the flooding. It was none other than the Lord Archer, Hou Yi, considered by Chinese mythology to be the greatest of all time, would deliver the fatal shot. An ancient term for panda, literally meaning iron-eating beast. Allegedly, this name derives from panda entering homes to lick or gnaw on metal pots and utensils, perhaps seeking out salt to supplement their diet. At the time, giant pandas were still at the level of mythical creatures, seen as fierce iron-eating beasts, warlike with sharp claws. Dongfeng Shou, around the time Wulong is said, commented this, there are beasts in the south, the size of rhinos with feet shaped like a buffalo. Their fur is as black as a moonless night. Iron is their drinking water, and their dung can act as a weapon. Last up in our roster is Zhu Yan, yet another fierce beast from the classic of mountain and sea. It is said that on Xiaozi mountain resides something that resembles an ape with a pale white head and hands and feet of crimson. The appearance of Zhu Yan signals a great war. Further details beyond that aren't known. This variety of myth fits in with the wild man myths shared by many cultures like the Yeti, Bigfoot, and Sasquatch. And that's a wrap for this episode. Let us know in the comments if you like part two, explaining more in depth of the three kingdoms and perhaps even get into the legendary warriors that have sculpted China's extensive history. See, See you, you next week. week.